Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I have a awesome guest. Uh, you may have heard his name around the uh, photography circle. <laughs> I've got uh, David Burnett with me today. Super excited. We're going to answer your questions. Um, I see a few of you are already here in the live stream right now. Uh, so if you're watching this, let me know where you are watching from. I'll leave that in the comment section. And also any questions that you guys have that you want to pose uh, to David, let me know in the comment section and you'll have the opportunity to have your questions answered. So I see a couple of people here, Pittsburgh uh, video guys here, uh, Michael Bruchas from Illinois. So very cool. Um, so let me give you a quick uh, introduction to my guest for today. Uh, David Burnett grew up in Salt Lake City, where he began taking pictures for the high school yearbook. He soon discovered the satisfaction of seeing pictures published in print. And upon graduation from college, he graduated from Colorado College, um, Poli Sci 68. Uh, he began a long relationship with Time and Life magazines. It was for Time Magazine in 1969 that a 22, that as a 22-year-old, uh, he covered the Apollo 10, 11, and 12 uh, missions and became forever enamored with the space program. He worked for Time and Life in Vietnam from 1970 to 72, and he returned just before the original weekly edition of Life stopped publishing. Uh, 1976, he co-founded Contact Press Images, the international photojournalism agency, which distributes his work around the world. Along the way, he's covered every American president since JFK, a dozen Olympic games, and countless stories of everyday life. He's based in New York City and is pleased that his dog's Instagram uh, has more followers than any of his friends. So with that uh, out of the way, let's <laughs> welcome... <laughs> Mr. The David Burnett. That's the one. My old, my puppy's Instagram has 300 followers or something. And, wow. Uh, yeah. You know, when we had, uh, at one point, a couple of years ago, um, one of our friends said, oh my God, don't ever say anything like that around my husband, my wife's friends. So he only has 50. And if he knew there was a dog with more <laughs> followers, it would be the end of him. So. Oh That's kind my of my view of of the online world. Yeah, well, you know, it's, well, it's, nice to be here. Nice to be here. It, it's good to have you. It's good to have you. Um, you know, we've uh, we've we've had you know a few opportunities to kind of uh, talk to one another, and uh, you know, I've always been kind of just fascinated by your mask. Look at that condo trip two point oh. We've, I mean, uh, I just have to be wearing this shirt. I mean, I know it's going to sound. Yeah, you, you got to represent this out but no it's a great i'm down in florida and i end up the exercise i'm getting the couple of weeks has been bicycling so this is a perfect weight for a bicycling shirt so nice so are you but, in yeah. are you in new york city or no i'm actually in palm beach and uh i came i was out doing a, a project in wyoming and california and then i went to la uh, my daughter, the actress, was in a show, and and then I came back to New York, and my wife had come down on what I refer to as snow avoidance duty <laughs> and had been in Florida for a while. And I came down here right after that. It was like middle, early part of March, and then everything just locked down. So I just stayed here, and uh, I mean, it's a little, it's been a little weird for me that this big story, which is kind of turning into the biggest story of our lives is going on. And I have to say, I'm not really shooting much. I haven't, you know, I'm in Palm Beach up in you know, North of Miami and Fort Lauderdale and touching my face. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I just have not like geared up and gloved up and masked up and gone out to shoot. I think probably if I was in New back in New York and I really made an effort to get back to New York, I probably could get back there. But I've just been, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore and I'm trying to just be a little bit smart about it. So That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, you're, well, you're right down the road from me because I'm in Orlando, Florida right now. So I'm sure. Well, so... Um, 
didn't realize you were a Florida guy too. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I'm I'm here. I'm happy to be here. It's turned into like honestly, I said to somebody the other day, it's the first time in 50 years I haven't like grabbed all my gear and gone out and tried to make sense of some story. And uh, you know, I have my mask made from a puppy T-shirt, little dinosaur, <laughs> um, and I'm pretty good about trying to wear it and. Unlike the governor of Florida, I actually know how to put mine on. Oh man, major burn! <laughs> I mean, did you see that one where he's I putting did. the ear thing over his head? And he had the but, other okay, one just I mean, hanging. Maybe, maybe he has a tiny head. I mean, I don't know. This I, there are people for whom that would work. No, anyway, you know, I, he was just staring at the thing for a minute, trying to make sense of it, and then just completely botched it. So pretty much everything that he said from that point on was just immediately discredited. It was just like- right. And you, rightfully so, yeah. Sure, sure, he doesn't qualify to talk well, on it. I have to say his, uh, at, on the other hand, his uh, signing interpreter is worthy of a uh, an Emmy, I think. I don't know if you've seen a couple of these things where he has the, the guys right next to him doing these, unbelievable movements to try and sign what he's saying. And I'm sure it's probably not that easy to interpret what he's actually trying to say, but. Oh, for sure, for sure. They're using words that probably, you know, no one even had it in their vocabulary like three months ago. So I saw one, I think the interpreter from Georgia uh, was the one that I saw and he was very animated. Well, like, this guy looks like, do you know, there was that very famous, um, video of um, Nelson Mandela. I think he was maybe accepting the presidency of South Africa or something like 15 or 20 years ago. And this guy got up next to him and is just doing like nonstop. Mm, 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 uh, uh, oh, I remember this. Total makeup. And then one of the, uh, one of, like one of the morning shows got on an actual signer and interpreted what this guy was saying. And all he was saying is like, I'm very happy and then to be here, I'm happy to see you and I'm very happy to be here. But he was just, he was on like it was the official guy. It was. It I was feel like this, there, this happened fairly recently. Was this a while back? Well, I'm sure it does happen. But I mean, I saw the governor uh, 10 days ago uh -huh. and the guy was unbelievable who was signing for him. Oh I mean, gosh, some yeah. of them are just doing their job some of them are going for an Emmy. Oh yeah, no doubt. They're trying to get on SNL, I think. You know, they want to yeah. they want to get spoofed when uh, when SNL finally gets around to doing their skits again. But you said something at the very beginning of this that I thought was really interesting and I wanted to kind of pick your brain about this because you know, you've covered a lot of major news stories. Um, you know, definitely, I mean, I was born in 1980. So you've covered news stories Dude, that <laughs> really? I mean I was already in decline by then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I think you were you were, you know, you were starting to get well, your, was, your, your wheels turning. That was, you know, it was Reagan. It was I mean 79 was an amazing year. Mm -hmm. 80. Um well we had the elections. That was Jimmy Carter's attempt at re-election. We had the uh, hostage crisis with Iran. Um you know, it's funny. Up until recently, I could almost remember every everything I've ever done. I mean, I'm starting to lose little spots here and there. The thing we did uh, at, at contact with all of our slides, um, I invested in, I don't know, it was like several thousand dollars for a printer attached to a little Radio Shack Trash 80 that gave you eight lines of 40 character text. Uh, four on t top of the slide and four on the bottom. And for the first time ever, you could actually print onto a slide mount what, what it was. Oh, wow. And we have for always done, uh, forever, always done the first three letters of the photographer. So I was B-U-R. And like the Iranian Revolution would be 7901, January of 79. And then... I had Paula Khomeini or whatever, and we carry that on now. I mean, I when I do my digital pictures, I do the same thing. It's B U R two zero zero four. I usually now that I can, I add the the date, so it'll be two zero zero four two two, 
mm-hmm. uh, Palm Beach, blah, 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 whatever it is. What this lets you do above all, and you have to do it year, month, day, is that everything becomes sorted by time. If right. you do it the stupid American way, which is month, day, year, mm-hmm. nothing gets nothing is sortable that way. But right. year, month, day, year, okay, big block, and then month, tinier, and then day, tiniest of all. And it's a great way to kind of, which is, I mean, I have friends who are like, hey, man, when I just said something the other day about uh, 1982 with the Pope, how'd you get that picture so fast? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that was the, well, actually, it was 83. It was uh, July of 83. The Pope went back to Poland for the first time after the crushing of solidarity. So I just type in on my laptop, which I don't have everything on my laptop, but I have a lot of stuff. I just do B-U-R-8306, boom, and it pops up that fast. And you can just, okay, and send it over. And somebody's like, holy crap, man, how'd you find it? So So how how, at this point, how many photos are we talking? You know, I have never counted them. I mean, it's, it, I started shooting Kodachrome in 74 or 5. Uh, the first role, I, I did a little bit in 73, but I was still working for Gamma. I worked for Gamma, the French agency, for two years right after life closed. And that was when I started getting into Kodachrome as a film. For those of you who don't know what film is, <laughs> Now, let's see, where is it? I have a little box here. Well, I've got my little Holga with 120 in there, but somewhere I have a box of film here. Um, Kodachrome was the most beautiful film, and there was Kodachrome 25, and then Kodachrome X, which was 64 ASA, but a little too contrasty, and the 25, to me, was pretty slow. In the summer of 1974, they came out with Kodachrome 64, and I was sent one role at the end of the French presidential campaign that I'd been the winning candidate photographer. And I had this one role, my 35 millimeter camera with an 85 on it, and I shot a roll of him, and I sent it to New York, and that became a Time Magazine cover. Oh, wow. And it was like, it was like all of a sudden 64 ASA you could deal with. Like I, I'm sure all the people whose names I see here, Camera Junkie and Molly and Gabriel, have never in their lives shot anything at ASA 64. And I, maybe I'm wrong. I could be very wrong. But I can't meet anybody else like, yeah, I'm shooting at 800 or 1,000, and if I have to go to 12,000, no problem, which these new cameras will amazingly do. But 64 was a whole other world, and it kind of forced you into understanding what the capabilities were that you had and what you, what you couldn't do, what you could and couldn't get away with, you know? And um, I don't know, I just, I've loved every, every stage of being a photographer. I started with a Rolly Flex at the high school yearbook, and then I bought my own Yoshika mat, which was the hundred dollar Japanese version of a Rolly flex twin lens reflex where you look down. find her up and look down shooting 12 square pictures, 12 pictures, not 1200, not 12,000, 12 wow. choose wisely. My friends, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, as, as Art Goldfinger said to James Bond, choose your next witness very carefully. Mr. Bond, it may be your last. <laughs> because that's how you had to be when you were shooting film. Even 36, that was like a big deal. But when you got up to like 28 or 29, you're starting to look around like, what could happen? And do I have enough here or do I need to reload really fast and be ready with a whole roll? Like covering the Olympics, mm-hmm. when you were doing a relay race or a long race that was like a 3,000 meter, like, uh that's uh, seven and a half laps and you're shooting five or six frames coming out of the corner and maybe six frames and then shoot the other camera and it's like okay every time they would run by you you'd have to see how many frames you had left on that roll of film every lap you had to do that and then figure out 
well, do I have enough to get one more? Yeah, what the hell? Nothing's going to happen, you know. And then yeah. when something happens, shoot wisely. That's the one thing. I think that's the only really obvious. Well, there's two things about digital photography. I mean, I realize you didn't ask a question. <laughs> no, no, this is <laughs> wonderful. This is great. Giving guests, I just keep I love talking. it. Um, no, the, the the one thing I I really dislike about the whole digital thing is that you shoot a picture, you immediately look at it on the back, and it's like, oh my god, see that, see that speaker there? Oh, see it? Oh my god, I'm going to shoot it, and then they go punch the button and say, oh my god, look at that. Mm -hmm. I am awesome. I well, can you see it? Okay, Nailed I must it. be an artist. <laughs> I must be an artist because look, I've just made art. Oh. So I hate that part that people are so self congratulatory out of the fact that they just made a picture. And um, I think something has been lost in the fact that an memory card will give you a couple of thousand pictures. And I kind of wish that people had that pit of the stomach worry about like, God, I've only got six frames left. How am I going to shoot them? And so even, even with people who love shooting as I do, I mean, okay, A9 with a 100, 400. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love this combination. I can, I can't say I can do everything with it, but I can do so much with, with it. Um, and I, I have a 70 to 200. <laughs> Almost never use because this thing is so good. But what I also understand is that everything has its moment and its limits. And I try and convince, especially people who are like just getting into photography right now, who have never understood, <laughs> who have never understood the pain of what happens when I only have three frames left, mm -hmm. to buy a little camera, like buy a little Holga for you know thirty bucks. They're making them again. Put a roll of Triax in. Put away the really good cameras that you're going to make your living with and go out and try and shoot 12 frames where every frame makes you think about what it is you're doing. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful exercise and a wonderful way of trying to force yourself into understanding um, how not to waste pictures. I mean, we, you know, with a memory card and batteries, unlimited space, it's not really, you're not really wasting it. It's like something that physically was here and then it's gone. But in your mind, you're, if you become sloppy, you know, when I, when I worked in France, one of my all time favorite descriptions of, from the agency photographers was they would just kind of be dismissing the, the machine gunners, you know, like, <laughs> you know, the oh, 36. Yeah. You could be through that in about 10, 15 seconds. And it was like, uh, c'est terrible gaspillage. And gaspillage is this French word that kind of is like a beautiful, flowery, poetic word that refers to waste. <laughs> like it just through a roll of film. And oh, it was like, great. of course, only the French could make it sound poetic and beautiful. <laughs> but um, honestly, there's something to understanding what your own discipline can be when you're shooting um there was a and i'm you know i'm rolling here there was <laughs> the guy that took the famous picture of harry truman the 1948 election when truman who was then president he inherited the presidency after roosevelt died and um uh, he ran against thomas dewey and the early returns looked like dewey was going to win and I think the Kansas City paper printed a headline saying Dewey wins, and there's a picture of mm -hmm. Truman holding the paper up. It's one of the like 20 most favorite famous uh, presidential political pictures ever ever done. It was done by a guy named Frank Kanzler, who was worked for United Press. I think at that point it might have been Acme News Pictures or something, 1948. But Kansi was one of these guys who. Um, he shot four by five up until probably the mid fifties. And then he shot with a, like a Rolly flex. And then probably by 1960 was using a, a Nikon. 
and that became the press camera for the whole of the 1960s. Some people would have a Leica very much beloved, but really the Nikons were the cameras with the interchangeable lens in there. And he, um, I saw him get off a plane where he had been the pool guy on the president's plane on Air Force One. And he walked up to the UP guy, and what they always did was they had the local guy there waiting, and there was a guy on a motorcycle to take whatever film the pool guy had shot on the plane and get hand it off, give it to the guy on the motorcycle who'd go downtown to the lab, <laughs> and they would soup it and everything. And right. I saw him take this roll of film. It was a 35-millimeter roll, hand it to the messenger, and, and they would always tell him, which pictures to go for it. Like they knew this one the best, or that was the best one. And he handed him the roll of film and he said, print them both. Whoa. He'd shot two frames. Mm -hmm. And he'd shot that 35 millimeter like it was a four by five camera, like it was a speed graphic. Uh, I mean, it was the opposite of overshooting and machine gunning and waste. <laughs> he only pushed that button, even though he had 20 or 36 pictures, he shot two and he knew that each one was a picture. And there's wow. something that I, I can't think that anybody working today couldn't understand from that. There's, there's something to take away from it that we could all, I mean, I think about it all the time. Like the fact, you know, when I got my A9 and I realized I could do 20 frames a second, um, there were a couple of things I shot that I had never seen before because the camera was so fast. It was getting into those little in-between moments. When you're shooting with a four, my original like Nikon F, I think was four frames a second. So I was like, bada, 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 bada. sounds like it's, well, I, I'm getting everything. Yeah. And you think you're getting everything. It sounds like a lot of camera, like a lot of film being exposed. But when you see what 20 or 24 frames a second looks like, yeah, you start insanity. to understand that there are all these little things in between those moments that are moments that you've never seen before. And, um, Does that I make it that. harder for you? Well, I mean, the, the, time, the thing is to know when to use it. I mean, I had, I had this amazing experience at the Korea Winter Olympics two years ago where first time ever I was shooting the skeleton sleds now that's, you know, there's bobsled where you climb in the sled and there's the guy that pushes on the back and then leaps on at the very back. And then there's luge where you mm -hmm. kind of sit on the, on the sled with your feet out in front of you. And then there's skeleton, aptly named when you see some of the accidents that happen. Oh, geez. <laughs> and that one is like riding a, like the way a kid would ride a sled. You've got your hands forward and your feet behind you. And what I had never seen before was the fact that the start of the skeleton, the sledder is leaning over and holding on to the sled and then start to run. And if you, I don't know how long it's been since you actually, probably when you had to grab your kid by a swimming <laughs> pool, or something, mm -hmm. leaning over and running are not really compatible. It's, an, it's something that requires a lot of training. But right. the sled drivers are leaning over and then running as fast as they can so their sled is right next to them. And as they're running, then they let go and they leap on. And I had always thought, I don't know why I thought this, just because I'd never seen it any other way. I just assumed there were always some point of contact between the sled and the driver. And I started shooting with the A9 at like 20 frames. And then I'm uh, really good. I, mean, I got to say the 100, 400 autofocus saved me because if I had to do it manually, it would never work. Mm -hmm. They're coming right at you. I'm parked just over the, uh, uh, you know, off to the side of the ice. So they're more or less coming right at you. And there's this moment when they run, 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 and then they leap and they're just floating mm. over the side. And I Crazy. had never seen that before. And the first time I shot a guy running at me, I looked at it and said, that's unbelievable. Look at that. I mean, nobody there, but I'm like, hey, Dave, look at the thing you just did. <laughs> you know, it's, one those, it's one of those moments where you, I have created art. 
Yep. Then I shot the next guy, and the next guy was floating over the sled. Wow. And then the next guy, and and it just blew me away because there are these little hidden moments, and frankly, um, and so many things. I think you're still better off shooting single frame than to machine gun something. Certainly, mm. when they're in most things, unless they're running right at you and it's a uh, single frame is the winner and it, it's really when you need to see that moment. So I don't know. I mean, I think there's a, um, there's something wonderful about the new camera gear. I, I love the new cameras and I love the old camera. I mean, to me, it's really, it's super fun when you can do both in the same day. I mean, I'll, right. I'll carry my, my Sony gear and I love the little guy. I've got this little 6,600. Mm -hmm. which is just with a funky old cinema lens on it from the 1940s. <laughs> and what's really cool about these little APS cameras is you can find almost any lens and almost any adapter ring. And because they're thinner and there's no mirror, um, anything that was ever designed for a, a still camera or a, in this case, a 16 millimeter movie camera, you can use on, a st on these digital still cameras. So it just gives you all kinds of opportunities to, to look for the look that a lens might have that's very special. This thing is amazing because it's ultra sharp in the center. And as you get out to the edges, it's got this amazing weird warped bokeh. And I love it. It's, uh, you know, you pretty much have to get somebody's face in the center of the frame. Otherwise they're gonna look like <laughs> they didn't survive the alley attack, but you know. And what, what did you say it was called? Something well, this is, is this is the Kodak 50 millimeter Anastigmat, and there's also a 50 millimeter Ectanon, E K E K T A K O N Ectanon. But the Anastigmat, and they're beautiful. They're they're fast. This is a, a 50 f 1.6. So it's on this camera, it's really about like a 75 because mm -hmm. you've got to up the thing a right. little bit. Pretty much covers a little bit of vignette, just artsy, fartsy enough that it looks cool. <laughs> right? And I've got an old Soviet-era uh, lens, uh, uh, a Helios lens from a Zenith that works on the, the full-frame cameras. It'll cover everything. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's everything is... Um, Everything's relative, obviously, and depending on what it is you're shooting, if you have the, um, if you have the uh, freedom to do what you want to do, that's one thing. Then you should explore. I mean, that was one of the things we talked about recently. Was just if you're kind of stuck indoors or you're stuck in some kind of isolation, this is a really great time to be exploring and like mm -hmm. take a lens you've never figured out what to do with. And I have a friend who lives in Philly, and she's just been photographing the, she's not downtown, downtown, she's out in the birds, mm -hmm. and nearby, I guess there's a park, and she's been making these pictures, her name is um, Sarah Bones, B-O-N-E-S, and she's been making these pictures that look like she's out in Arizona or New Mexico, and they're like 20 minutes from Philadelphia. It's That's crazy. It's cool. Because it's a, it's a good time, you know, where there's so much frustration. There is a lot of work for some people and not a lot of work for most people would be my guess right now. And, um, you know, if you're going to get in and really work the story, uh, you need to, you need a lot of precaution. You need gloves and mask and so forth. Um, so now we're looking at a picture of mine. Yeah, somebody, uh, Gabriel was asking, and I don't know if this oh. is the photo. I was trying to... Actually, that was that was the last night of the Denver 2008 convention when they, at um, uh, Bronco Stadium, outdoors. So tons of light all the way around, and then a couple of big hot lights nearby, and that was Barack and... Uh, uh, Michelle? Oh Michelle Obama, how could I, like... <laughs> It's, hey, it's been a while since they've been on the stage. It's been a while. Everybody's name. 
Yeah, that was just after he gave his acceptance speech and the family came up and it was, um, that was my canon period, I think. I probably like a 80 to 200 or a 70 to 70 to 200, something like that. Okay, and, so you, uh, were, you were a bit farther back and then just kind of uh, pushing Well, in. they were on a little uh, uh, runway that kind of came out a ways and they walked. They were walking out to the end of the runway where we were. And, and they got closer than that. I have some really tight faces. I'm pretty sure. I don't think I had the 300. I think it was 70 to 200. Okay. So that answers that question. Okay. So Michael, Actually, Michael B, the 6600, that, did you get that? It's Kodak Anastigmat. Anastigmat. We got that one. Um, yeah. I actually have a question for you, too, because um, I know you love working with uh, these vintage lenses. And I was curious to figure out. So uh, I started with film. Uh, mm -hmm. this was like late nineties for me, uh, when I started right. with, with photography. And, uh, so, <clears throat> you know, some of these older lenses, obviously they weren't things that I was familiar with back then. And even now at this point, not really too familiar with them, but, um, I was curious to figure out when you were shooting back then on film, you were talking about the, the film stocks that were available. Um, obviously mm -hmm. they weren't great in low light. Uh, I imagine that came. Well, that's why they had tripods. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, and you really, honestly, you realized how valuable even a, a cheap little tripod was. I mean, so I've been, I'm not to cut you off here, but mm -hmm. I'll just say one thing. I started shooting with my 4x5 seriously in 2003 and, and in 04. And I, uh, I, at one point, I had a big tripod and I just, it was too much to carry. So then I found a little, a Velbon traveler and i put a ball head on it and it like 40 bucks but it got up high enough that i could i could look at my camera and my knees would still survive <laughs> and it was not it wasn't a question of like a giant heavy gets so you just needed something to calm it down and shooting with a cable release you know it's like this is that's that's sign language for a cable release <laughs> um, and it was uh, uh, it was really uh, you know it added so much sharpness. So mm -hmm. when you you know when in doubt, I mean, at light if the light is crappy, go with it and just keep the camera from moving. Back then, that's, did that's you why buy they have cable? Right, right. And so the tripod was a was a big accessory. But back then, when you would consider buying a fast lens like that. Kodak, right. uh, you know, 1.7 or uh, any fast glass at that time. Were you buying it because of the fact that you couldn't right. basically of the so limitations this, of shooting in low light? So this does fall into the category of what's your favorite f-stop, which is yes, a, 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 a fair question. Um, I fell in love with, and I still use with an adapter ring on all my Sony cameras. A Canon, about a 1983 red line, 50 millimeter F1.2 L. And the L, the L lenses were the big deal for Canon. And I mean, the new, you know, the new stuff is so good. It's so good. And I just haven't gotten around to, you know, I'm still trying to use the stuff that I'm, you know, it's, uh, you know, the new cameras have also got, the joy of the C2 button here, which mm -hmm. oh, there it is, which you can set up. I mean, I guess you can set up any button, but I like the C2 because it's right up there. And that's the blow the little TV screen that I'm looking at right now up about 8X. And then I just go in on somebody's eye, move the little orange box around, lock on the eye, and I go right to focus. Right. And um, like uh, two years ago, I did a trip to um where was it uh, let's see was it 18 no was it two years ago 18 2018 uh i did a trip in the spring of 2018 to the world war one battlefields in france and i took an a9 with a that 50 cannon on it and i did the whole shoot with that and i was on assignment i was just shooting for myself but i wanted to be able to take pictures that i liked mm -hmm. and it was uh it's it was a beauty, and um, that 51 2L, 
and shooting at one two, and I I try to have it uh, uh, the back of it changed to put a like an EOS mount on it. And the guy that I sent it to couldn't make that work, and he just sent it back to me with the regular FD mount. But it broke the stop down deal, so everything with that lens is always at one two, and it's it's great. I love it. I love it for portraits. I you know it's the one lens. If I had to come down to one lens, I could mm -hmm. easily make a career out of that one lens. And it's always wide open. And I have, uh, you know, I have the, I've shot with, I don't have, <clears throat> I don't have one yet. The, the new Sony 135 eight. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's, I know my I, I've shot with it and that's like, uh, yeah, how do I not have that? Cause I'm an old 135 F2 guy. I mean, 50, a 28, a 50, and a 135, which are basically the lenses that sort of advanced amateurs used to have. Now, of course, mm -hmm. the, all the amateurs have got better cameras than you do. <laughs> yeah, it's and crazy. Their, and their dental practices are flourishing. Yes, but, yes. Um, honestly, uh, there, there's so much good stuff now. I mean, I love, I moved over to the Sony stuff because I really thought, the ease of shooting, I, I adapted super fast to looking at a little miniature T screen instead of through the lens as such. Um, figured that out really fast. I love the speed. I love the quiet. So and uh, and with the uh, like the 100, 400 autofocus, it's just like I'm not as fast as I used to be. I mean, I was a pretty good follow focus guy at a football game, mm -hmm. and I just am not as good at that as I used to be. And and no one's as good as Walter Yost, even you know, when we were really good. I don't know if you know who Walter is. Great, I've heard the name. I've heard the name. Yeah. He, was, he was the guy who was like the colonel of follow focus. He could just take a long lens. And I mean, Neil Lifer probably would take some exception. To, <laughs> take some exception. But no, Walter was the master of follow focus. And, Man. Uh, that's an art um, right there. That's so, uh, you know every to me everything has its place. I mean I love this. I love what we're surrounded by now. I mean this stuff is so good. Now when I came to Florida, I didn't really think I was going to be coming for a couple of months. I packed an A9 6600. I have the new really nice 16 to 50 2.8 mm -hmm. zoom lens for the 6600. It's made for the small uh, sensor. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's fast, and it's all those good things that you want. And then I brought a bunch of my funky glass, which are all sitting in <laughs> the next room on the bed that is my camera hangout. Um, uh, one of the things I've been trying to do down here is where I'm staying is very near the, I mean, literally like 50 yards that from this little island that is the home to like hundreds of big seabirds every mm -hmm. night. And then Six in the morning, it's like, okay, breakfast, and they mm -hmm. all fly away. But then sunset, they come back, and the look uh, of the way these squadrons of ibises come in at sunset, it's absolutely awesome. like an air show. It's like the Paris air show. <laughs> and they, they don't kid around, and they'll be, they'll be some smart-ass flyer who's going to get his wings taken away, but who's cutting a turn in oh front of everybody gosh. else. It's really something. So I've been trying to shoot some high-speed video of these birds, and mostly I'm just out there like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> you know, then forgetting, oh, yeah, I'm trying to take video of this. <laughs> and I did this little two-minute video I just uh, put up on my Vimeo feed as a salute to Earth Day today and really mm -hmm. talking about how the Earth from Apollo 13, when the crew – you know, this is the mission where the tank blew up, the oxygen tank right. blew up, and they never went to the moon. Then they circled the moon and came back and landed. It, with all that mistaking stuff going on, landed within about six miles of the pickup ship after a half-million-mile trip. That's crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's closer than me going to Walgreens, you know. Yeah, like, I don't think that close to Walgreens. But the... Uh, uh, the remark from Jim Lovell, the astronaut who had already previously been around the moon, he said, you know, the Earth is the only place in this whole universe that has any color. And, uh, you know, on Earth Day, that's my little... But I was out shooting pictures of these herons and these 
cranes and so I don't even know what the birds are. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the ibis I know because they have that little yeah. cranky little curved beak and they're adorable. And boy, do they know how to fly. And they've inspired oh, yeah. me. I'm writing a short story about a World War II aviator and these birds. Not done yet. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing that. Well, you know, the thing is, we we are living in this time of luxury. There's so many, there's there's no longer an excuse available about how come your camera didn't work. Like, right. uh, sorry. It's operator uh, error every time. Died about <laughs> five years ago. Ugh. Everybody's making great gear. The stuff is compared to what it can do is like pretty affordable and and there's no reason you can't blame your camera anymore you can't say right. oh it was on frame 38 yeah you know, one of our comments here was about frame 38 which we've all been there yep. um actually jennifer walker had a question i don't know if this means anything to okay. you but she yeah. says she would love to hear about working the story does that mean anything to you well, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I worked for Time Magazine when I was still in college and then uh, continued freelancing for them when I went to Vietnam. I got on with Life Magazine. Of course, Life in the days when it was the old weekly, everything in there was the picture story. And um, I think, you, you know, I never took a journalism class. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might have taken one actually in summer school, but uh, you know I didn't go to the University of Missouri, and I was not uh, you know none of my teachers wrote the photojournalism uh, textbook. But I mean it's funny when you when you talk to the I have a few friends who did go to Missouri and who had Angus McDougall as their professor and who really instilled in them this whole understanding of how you can't just let the writers be in charge of the story. You have to decide what the story is. You have to make, I mean, I, I remember having a conversation with a, a young guy who was my age. He just passed away a year ago. John, uh, oh my God, not John Sexton. John, I'll think of his name. Um, uh, he was a young life magazine photographer and we had lunch. I had just come back from Vietnam and, and we we're talking. He said, "Like, you know, what? What do you bring to your story? Do you bring a point of view, or are you?" And I was kind of still at that point where, well, I'm not. I, my only point of view is that I want to tell the story. I want to get involved in the story, and I'm not. In most cases, the stuff I'd been doing, um, it wasn't so much that I was being someone who was trying to uh, tell a story of intrigue and corruption as it was, here's a story, is a, something that's going on, and I just want to tell that story. And so for me, it was always about remembering the very basic things, like you have to always be thinking, like, how do I, you know, I need an opener. I mean, we still talk, even though things are not so much as a magazine, like they, they were for all of those years of the 70s and 80s and 90s, and even into um, the new century, but you had, you'd open up that magazine and if you were lucky, there would be a big, uh, a big spread and your name might be on it. That would be even better. Right. And then that was the opener. And you had to like, I need a picture. And I've heard like when I was young, when I was in my early twenties, I remember some of these life photographers talking to each other about, yeah, saying, yeah man, geez, I got some good stuff, but I still don't have an opener. Mm. How am I going to tell that story? What's the first picture going to be that somebody's going to turn that page and then all that they're going to want to do is to keep turning that page and see mm. what the story is that I'm telling them. And it doesn't have to be linear and it doesn't have to be something that you, you, you can only express in one certain way. It's just let's figure out what it is we're trying to say and let's come up with Okay, we got our opener, and I've also heard the other part, which is, "Geez, man, I got the opener, but you know, I got I got to fill in the narration. I got to tell the story." Right. Yeah. Have you ever so, bumped yeah, heads I, with a writer? Uh, you know, I was pretty lucky. I, I mean, I had a couple that I probably 
if I could, if I could think of their names, <laughs> I would shame them. Um, but in many cases, I was lucky to be working with writers who I would be so focused on trying to see one thing that I'd miss what was right in front of me. And in fact, in this one story in Vietnam, uh, we're at this fire base and we're looking for, a, I don't remember, we're going to find something. And along the way, we see a guy that we know and his, his girlfriend, a local Vietnamese girl, uh, and she has got her little purse and he's got his rifle and he's got a backpack. In addition to the purse, she's carrying the grenade launcher. Mm. And it was just this light. It was like this little middle America scene of a couple on the front of their house uh, posing for a picture, except here we are at a fire base in the middle of, of um, I Corps or two Corps actually. And, and I'm just like uh, talking to the guy about what's going on. And my writer's like, well, English guy. He's like, well, maybe I ought to make a couple of pictures. And I think, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a really good idea. And that, of course, that, ran full page. that picture ran a full page or maybe a page and a half or something in the story. Oh so I, 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 I'm lucky in that I, I know that I don't see everything. I did, I did a project, I can't even believe that it. it's like 30 years ago with, um, it was a PBS show called On Assignment. And it was a one hour show and they spent about 15 minutes of it with me and about 20 minutes with Alfred Eisenstadt, the famous life photographer, and about 15 or 20 minutes with Jody Cobb, who was on assignment in Jerusalem for National Geographic. And Jody, in one of the times she's sort of talking to the correspondent about it, the whole thing, she said, something that I've tried to remember ever since, because those, this was back in the, uh, like the early 80s when you'd still get sent for, for the geographic for months at a time sometimes. They, right. still had, they still had the money and the interest and the budget and the, and the, the desire to just make it all good. Mm -hmm. So she said, every, every time, you know, I got a lot of my friends are passing through, people come through Israel on their way somewhere, and, Every time somebody comes in, I ask them, say, uh, what do you notice that's kind of interesting or shocking or um, what do you, you know, what strikes you? So I've been here six weeks and I'm already so used to what I'm seeing here mm -hmm. that I know I'm missing things because the familiarity is overriding my curiosity. Right. I thought, wow. that, and she didn't even put it quite in those terms. It was just like she knew she needed help. And what I thought was so cool was that from that, uh, I have always tried to remind myself to ask people what's going on because that is sometimes that's the key. You know, you're um, you're hoping that you've got everything, but you never do, and so right. <laughs> it always pays to ask. I mean, some people are incredibly. Uh, full of self-confidence about knowing what it is they've got. It's like, I'm never quite that full. I mean, I, yeah. you know, the film days, you never knew right. until you either developed it or, but working as I did for magazines, the film would go in an envelope, the envelope would get sent to the airport and the airport, the plane would fly across the country or across the state or around the world. And then it would be picked up by a guy on a motorcycle and he'd take it to the lab <laughs> and they'd write it up. And like a couple of days later, maybe you'd find out. I mean, somebody here asked about the Mary Decker picture from the Olympics in 1984. Mm -hmm. That was one of those because this turned out. Let's see if I can find it. it was, talk about it. Yeah, it was. It's. I think it's under the classics. Maybe it's or or sport. I'm not sure. Sport. Um, but she had been denied a chance to run at the 1980 Olympics because the U.S. boycotted. Uh, the Moscow games and um, the young South African runner who couldn't run for South Africa because of apartheid. So but her mother had British lineage. So she was running for the UK and it became this, you know, the press, you have to say the press is usually looking for a good story. So this was Mary and Zola, Zola and Mary. Uh, that's the one right there. So this one here? Um, yeah. So this this picture was 
you know, I had I had spent much of that week of, of track and field down near the finish line. And I was just, by the end of Friday afternoon, which was the last, entering the last weekend of the Olympics, I was so tired of all these guys. In those days, everybody had tripods with little uh, bogan clamps to have like 16 cameras on your tripod. And it was just like too much. And I had a 400 2 weight and I had a, I guess, a, a 80 to 200 or a 70 to 200. And I had two or three cameras. Um, and I just started walking down the track. You could still do that in those days. And I got about, oh, about halfway down and I saw a bench with two photographers on it about the 40 yard, the far 40 yard line. I just said, hey guys, you got room for one more? And they said, yeah, come on over. And all of a sudden I just felt this great feeling of liberation from having to be squished in with everybody else, the, mm -hmm. the finish line shot. Now there's a reason that people go to the finish line. There's so much drama and there's so much excitement and there's so many good pictures that come from the finish line that that's why people go there. So it's always heavily staffed. But, so this was down just after turn four as they would come around the track. And this is what I was talking about earlier about, you know, every time the runners would come around and this was 3,000 3, meters. And from the, the, the opening gun, Mary Decker, who was here in red, Mary was, the, was leading the race all the way. And they'd come around and they go the first turn and the second turn and then the third turn and they come around our turn and I'd shoot with a 400. And then just as they come by, I would drop that and pick up an 85 and get them as they'd go by. Just had enough time to change cameras. And then you had about 45 seconds till they're coming around again. They did not ever wait for a photographer to change film. So that's why this whole thing about, well, do I have enough? Well, I got 27 frames. So, okay, we got one more. And then, and then. And I don't know what lap it was, but it was like fourth or fifth lap. Zola Bud makes her move and decides to, to take the lead. And she comes out of the fourth turn and then cut back in front a little too early. And I was by then shooting. I put my 400 down. I picked up the 85. And I'm just getting coming across here. And, of course, with the new mirrorless cameras, you wouldn't have this issue. But a mirrorless camera, you only saw what was going on when you weren't taking a picture, when the mirror right. was down. The mirror's up taking a picture, it's just darkness. It's so you see this flash of stuff, and I'm just seeing this flash of red moving in a way that I kind of <laughs> suspect isn't supposed to happen. And Mary has tumbled and fallen off the oh, track man. into the runway, and all the runners go by, and I look up, like we're all just horrified that this has happened. And I grab my 400, and I, this is then like the fifth or sixth frame that I made with the 400. And I remember, you know, pre autofocus and I kind of, I remember having this conversation with myself. <laughs> it just makes sure we're sharp. And it probably was a half a second that I thought that, but I just took that extra little tweak to make sure I was sharp and I sh shot six, seven, eight frames. And then the infield, by then the infield photographers came over and just stood with their 24s and were shooting and essentially blocking everyone else. So the race ends, it's won by a young uh, woman runner from Romania, but it, this is huge because this is man bites dog. Right. You know, dog bites man, yeah, well, it's not really news, it happens all the time. Man bites dog. That's news. And so this kind of fell into that category. And her, uh, her boyfriend, who she later married, and I, I saw her a year ago in Oregon. I saw her for the first time in 35 years. And wow. it was a pleasure to see her under more pleasant circumstances. <laughs> um, but she was, her, uh, her husband was a shot putter, big British guy, came over, picked her up, and scooped her up and carried her away. And it just was, it was a, one of those horrific events because it wasn't supposed to happen. And I got my film out of my camera and stuffed it in my right jeans pocket. And then it got into an envelope and then a guy took it and disappeared. And you just see your film disappearing with a runner. 
you know, that's how things were. You just, you, and all the steps along the way, what I talked about before, you know, the motorcycle to the airport, put it on the plane, gets picked up by the motorcycle guy at JFK and driven downtown and up to the lab and inscribed into the, the book of, of pictures. And then, uh, you know, eight or nine, 10 o'clock New York time, the film comes down, boom, 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 boom. They find it, so yeah, that's it. And it ran a half page in Time Magazine, which doesn't sound like much, but in Time Magazine, a half page in those days was still a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And it later ran in probably 30 or 40 magazines, uh, double page here, double page there. But it kind of became this picture. But by the next morning, I didn't know if I had a picture. I still didn't know. And I ran into our, <laughs> our editor about 11 o'clock they said, well, should we go call New York and see how you did? Like, do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> really, do we have to do that? Can I just go have lunch? Uh -huh. uh, you know, and I called <laughs> New York. And, you know, there was no way yet of seeing it. I couldn't just, like, put it up on a screen because screens didn't exist yet. Right. And so uh, I called New York and I got Michelle Stevenson on the phone and, and I could barely, I would like, well, I'm Michelle, <laughs> Michelle, you know, how, how'd it do? How we, look? oh, it looks okay. We're going to use one. Like, oh my God, it's only okay. Yeah, seriously. I, I still didn't even see it. That was on a Saturday morning. The games ended Sunday. And I left Sunday morning to go join the Geraldine Ferraro vice presidential campaign. And it was only like Monday afternoon or Tuesday on the Ferraro campaign that somebody finally had a copy of Time Magazine and I saw the picture. So, you know, it's, there was there's something wonderful about that awful feeling about not knowing, I think. Uh, sometimes I think maybe we know too much. Right. But it was, you know, it, and it was, you know, it was a good... It was a good picture and it got well used and that's all you can ever ask for. You know, it, uh, it, um, and I, I photographed Mary last year with her puppies and it was the perfect segue after 35 years. That is awesome. That's, that's a, a crazy, crazy story. Um, I recently saw, and we're talking late, uh, I guess this article was from November 15th, uh, when you were covering the impeachment hearings. And I remember uh, I, I saw you on TV and uh, there you were with this uh, giant camera, which I couldn't really tell exactly what it was uh, just from the few you know, shots that they were showing on the news. But um, you know, it turned out later that you were using a four by five camera to shoot the impeachment hearing. So uh, tell me a little bit about what what was your well, thought process into doing the whole, that? The whole joy of shooting a four by five has to do with uh, the essential uh, conversation you have your, with yourself starts out with, okay, how am I going to put myself at a disadvantage today? <laughs> and uh, and you know, I've shot different camera uh, formats, medium format. I loved shooting with my uh, Mamiya medium format cameras in the mid 90s, both sports and politics. And then about 2003, 2004, I picked up a speed graphic and, and I found this, what I, I'm kind of the guy that gets the blame for the repopularization of the Aero Ektar lens because I took my four by five out and it came with the standard little uh, 127 millimeter Ektar. It's kind of a wide, like a 35 millimeter F 4.7. Now with Tri-X, you could maybe get away with a 30th of a second or something, but uh, 4.7 just seemed kind of slow. And kind of at the dawn of finding stuff out on the internet, 2003, I found out that there, and I don't even know where I saw it originally, but that there had been this lens that Kodak had made for the Army Air Corps in the 1940s for an aerial reconnaissance camera called the K20, well, among others, the K24, which was this giant camera that took 
100 feet of five inch wide film and would get bolted up into the bomb bay of a B-17 or a camera bay of a P-38 or a P-51. And they would send them out to do recon pictures and find out where enemy movements and tanks and everything were. Right. And this lens was considered a really big deal because being an F 2.5, 178 millimeter or seven inches, but at F 2.5, it meant that the planes could fly at like six or seven in the morning and they didn't have to wait until noon. And because their lenses at that point were all F 6.3 and F 5.6. But this way, this lens created this whole new kind of aerial photography, recon photography. Mm -hmm. So I heard about this lens. I got a hold of one somewhere. I don't know where. I think I paid probably about 75 bucks for it. Over the years, collected, I've got three or four others, including one that's still on a, a K24 camera that I've never opened. There was a whole batch in late 1944, there was a whole batch of cameras with the really, the really hotsy totsy lenses. Uh, by then they had, had time to really ref refine it and these cameras. And they, in the spring of 40, they're getting ready to ship them to Europe and the war ends. And then it was like, well, maybe we ought to send them to the Pacific. And then that, by the time, you know, it was the army, it took them three months to figure out how to turn the stuff around. And by that time, the Pacific war had ended. So I'm sure some supply sergeant said, well, I just put it in that warehouse over there. And so like 200 of these cameras, never having been opened, were put away in storage. And about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, I can't even remember how long it was now, some guy had bought at auction, you know, like the storage wars uh, on the Discovery Channel. I'm sure it was one of those deals where he got a, a whole container of K24 cameras. Wow. And I bought one for 200 bucks. And all I can tell you is I wish I'd bought two or three of them. But <laughs> it's still, and it's got painted, it's got that sort of st stenciled on the side of the cardboard box, still unopened. Wow. Camera, K24, uh, Aero Ektar, uh, 7 inch, 2.5, and then the uh, serial number. I mean, the stuff was. It's just these perfect little time capsules that are now 75 years old. And uh, the one I never opened, I just don't plan on opening anytime soon. Uh, anyway, I took that lens and I put it on a funky old speed graphic camera, camera body, which had the reason that was the speed graphic was that that meant that it was also equipped with a shutter in the back of the camera body, which meant the focal plane shutter right in front of where the lens or where the film was behind the lens. And it meant that if uh, you needed to have a lens that didn't have a shutter built in, because most of the big camera lenses had a shutter built in that would just, you know, you'd set it right. and it would shoot like that. This one didn't have that. So this had the focal plane in the back of the camera. I started shooting with it. And the first thing I did I, it was like General, um, what's his name, uh, who briefly ran for president, um, silver haired guy. Oh my God. Anyway, shot a couple of frames of him, processed it at home because you could still get Polaroid positive negative, and that was really easy to process. I never got into really processing film, film, but the positive negative, and I'd shoot some stuff. I'd make a quick scan, I'd send it to Time, Newsweek, and US News. And every time I did that, somebody would buy the picture. Oh, wow. And the pictures just started looking differently enough. And by this point, it was interesting because now in like 2004, everybody's doing digital. Mm -hmm. Everybody's using autofocus. And pretty much everybody's using a 17 to 35 and a 70 to 200 and maybe a 2470. So even though people are still doing their own pictures and doing them in their own way, they're all using the same gear. Right. And so for me, this was like, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the ass to carry this thing around, but um, I'm going to end up with something that inherently is different. Shooting, I almost would never, except if it was on a tripod and it was a really bright day and I might stop it down to F8, but normally this thing, I always would shoot open F25, wide open, 
uh, finally figured out on my speed graphic that if I got the Cambo reflex back, it was just like a little viewer looking into a 45 degree mirror and it would snap on the back of the camera. And then you'd look at the ground glass and you could focus really quickly and then put your film in, cock the shutter. It would still take you forever to shoot. Everybody else would have made 20 <laughs> frames by now. And right. you're still getting ready to take your first frame. But I, I got a, a great run. Uh, my friends at Time Magazine really liked what I was doing with it. And I did a 2004 um, walk up to the Olympics, the Olympic uh, hopefuls. Everybody from Michael Phelps to um, the two ladies who won all the, the beach volleyball, um, Misty Mae Trainer and her partner, I forget her name, uh, divers, swimmers, runners. Uh, I, I remember going through two boxes of Polaroid, trying to figure out, I had a, a sprinter, his name also escapes me, but I figure, okay, he's sprinting and he's gonna be going like this. Uh, I had been totally mesmerized by a picture of Jacques-Henri Lartigues that he'd made when he was about 12 of an open air car in France in about 1913, in which he had over panned, he panned faster than the car. And, it, and there's this, it's a famous picture. If you do a, a Google search of Lartigue car, this picture will pop up. And the car just kind of stretches down in a very melted, milky looking way across the frame. And I thought, I wanna try and do that with a sprinter. And I had my assistant who wasn't that fast <laughs> trying to run it. You know, I was trying to figure out well, how fast do I have to turn? I went through all these Polaroids and peeling them and nothing worked. So it didn't, you know, stuff does not always work. But I love shooting that stuff and it kind of got in my blood. And I ended up winning the uh, World Press Photo sports series award in 2005 for 2004 pictures including my my um olympic pictures from athens because i took the camera with me to athens and i shot with my my one then i had one digital camera and uh, which i think was like a d20 can d20 but then i had this four by five and i just shot and shot and shot and shot and that one, and there was this crazy, wonderful, crazy Dutch photographer who um, came and met me at the award ceremony and was so intrigued by this four by five thing that he started a website dedicated to what he called the Burnett Combo, which was a speed graphic with an arrow ectar lens on it. And it's now it became too big of a deal to put on his own website and it's now moved over to Facebook. And I think we have 1100 followers or members. Now. Oh, wow. called, the group's called Dancing with Speeds and referred to how I would be running around with my speed graphic and then I'd shoot with the Holga and shoot with the Mimi and shoot with the Canon. And all the time I had my arm wrapped around the speed graphic on a tripod because I didn't want it to get it knocked over. <laughs> uh, and that became, and I wrote a column about it called Dancing with Speeds, and that became the name of this thing. So these pictures are uh, with my Aero Liberator, which is a Graflex Super D that the, an, the estimable John Minix has converted from a three and a quarter, four and a quarter camera to a four by five. So there's a little, you see the, let, the bars left and right cuts a little bit off the four by right. five frame. But it's basically an SLR four by five. And I can't even talk about it without holding my hands like this. But it's, <laughs> it's, a, um, you know, it's not for everybody, but uh, uh, Frank Thorpe, uh, an NBC producer and an equally crazed large format photographer uh, has been doing some great stuff during uh, uh, impeachment. And I have to say Frank was there every day. That was really his job. I was kind of in and out depending on who the witnesses were and what happened. And, you know, once it got over to the Senate, it wasn't photographically, it wasn't that interesting because it all took place on TV behind closed doors. But I, I loved trucking around the hill with my, uh, my liberator, 
trying to find a way to make a picture. And again, this is what I think is really important. You, there's nothing wrong with tying one hand behind your back and, and trying to be the person who makes the most out of it. This was when Nancy Pelosi announced who the Democratic managers of impeachment would be. I mean, the story kind of ended and then there was uh, COVID-19 and it's kind right. of, we, we're living in a time of such compression that stories don't live very long. You know, a story has a much a much uh, tighter life than ever uh, we would have thought before. And stuff just, you know, it's a story, boom, and it isn't. This is a beautiful little statue of George Washington. And one day I was waiting for Pelosi to come down those stairs and, I, well, it's only a sheet of film. Might as well try something. <laughs> Sometimes well, you end up getting the coolest that, shots that way. <laughs> Minix uh, has designed this camera. It's amazing because it's it's got the arrow ectar in front, but it also has swings and tilts. So mm. you can kind of do funky things or funkier things. So those are some of my colleagues. Go back one. Uh, this one? Yeah, this is, and I, uh, I had prints made up this one for everybody, and I, Wrote, the guy on the far right is Jonathan, uh, oh my God, what's his last name? From uh, Reuters. And on his picture, I did, I think I did actually write, sorry, you were out of focus, but I was shooting at F2.5. So somebody's <laughs> really out of focus, but I think at least hopefully he's got a print by now. Uh, that's awesome. What's so cool about these shots too is that, I mean, honestly, I, 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 you've covered three impeachments and I was looking at all of the photos and it's mm. even hard for me to figure out when these photos were taken. I mean, these are like timeless, classic you know, photos. I have to say the one thing that I really love about shooting these big camera four by five, so much of what we do, uh, you know, with cameras that are shooting at, at one, one four or something, we ha they do have that very present look about them. And I, what I really like about these, frankly, I like that not everybody's sharp. You right. know, I mean, I like, uh, I'm I'm perfectly happy to just kind of try and take your eye to one place in that picture, and uh, you know, like like we did a we did a I did a movie a few years ago called The Gefilte Fish Chronicles about my wife's big Jewish family, and from that was kind of adapted as a musical, <laughs> uh, which go on my Facebook page you can see the link to it, which they reconstructed the musical this week using Zoom and all the actors. He's 14 actors all in different places, and it's really quite fun. But there's a great line in which a uh, the the family photographer who in the 40s and 50s showed up at all the events with his big 4 by 5 and a press 25 bulb and boom, would take these explosive shots of the family. And he comes back and meets the next generation and... And he says, yeah, my name is Ruby Wexler. I'm the photographer. I did every, every Seder, every bris that his family ever had. And she said, Ruby Wexler. Oh, I know that name. Your name is stamped on everybody's forehead in the pictures. And he says, yeah, yeah, you know, my proofs were so good that they never bothered to buy prints. And they kind of look at the proofs, even with the, the, the thing stamped on the forehead, they said, hey, we know what we look like. <laughs> What's the problem? So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's um, there's something wonderful about that timeless quality, which I think the large format cameras. And for me, what I really love about it is I love having, I love having the newest camera, with the oldest lens, and uh, you know, it's Jonathan Ernst. Yeah, thank you, Pete. There it is. <laughs> uh, I love, I love that. So I, I wanted to ask you, because uh, we're, we're uh, closing in on our time here. I want to do a rapid fire uh, Q&A session with you. So I'm okay. going to give you, we'll say like two yeah, minutes. We've got to let people get back to their lives. Here. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I mean, yeah. I, I could talk to you all day because I, I love I love hearing these stories. Um, you know, and hopefully if you, you guys are... <laughs> if you guys are enjoying them, uh, people who are watching right now, leave a thumbs up on the video and uh, let us know in the uh, comments what your favorite story has been so far. But uh, I Michael, wanted to ask, how many film holders did you pack? 
Uh, they don't make them anymore. And quite frankly, I think it's a gigantic mistake. But, but Think Tank made for me a set of four by five film holders that go on their speed belt. And they're, I wear a belt with two of these things. They're about this big vertically. Mm -hmm. And the film, instead of going in that way, where you would snag up, the uh, the dark light and potentially ruin it. It's they're long and skinny, so the film goes in this way. So there's mm. virtually no chance of that problem. And I can get eight holders in each one, so I have basically 16 holders, 32 sheets of film, and maybe if I have a shoulder bag, I'll have a few extra holders. But if you can't get it in 36 pictures, you should go back to uh, shooting with a memory card. <laughs> I mean, really, oh, man, I mean, I know, I mean, 30 <laughs> pictures a day. So every time you hit the shutter, you're really thinking about it. That's that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So I want to ask you a few questions. Um, some right. of these were questions that I received online. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them are questions that I have for you. Uh, the first one is that nowadays there's kind of a trend in photography uh, you have photographers that are kind of in two camps. Um, most of them are in the camp of underexposing their photos when they take them. And so I was curious to figure out, uh, and again, you know, short answer, but uh, do you underexpose or do you overexpose your photos? I try, and, and this is what I love about looking at the back of my camera is, and that I never knew when, the only thing on the back of my camera was a little piece of cardboard that said Kodachrome. Mm -hmm. That didn't tell me much. Um, <laughs> I try and get it right on. I would probably go to underexpose just because you had a better chance of of recovering it right. rather than overexpose, not so much. But I also, you know, I grew up in that age where I always overexposed my black and white, like my triax. I'd always give it an extra stop because I couldn't print a thin negative. So I, I was ready to go through and try and print. This is like the act of putting the negative in the <laughs> mark. Right. Uh, uh, I would try and just not end up with a super thin negative. That just would like, oh, my God, really? Yeah, it's super thin. Not happy. So, yeah, I mean, now it's very different. Slide film was very different than black and white film. Black and white film, overexposed color. Slide film, underexposed. Gotcha. All right. Yep. And you kind of talked about this one a little bit, but um, uh, to, to kind of uh, get a more kind of direct answer, would you say that it's better to be a technical photographer or to be an artistic photographer? Well, I think, you know, why do you take pictures? You really take pictures as a point of expression. So if, if that's the dichotomy, which I don't really think is quite fair, but artistic parentheses, you can always learn technique. Now that doesn't right. mean that people will or do, but the technique is something, uh, you know, there is, uh, there's this guy in Rome. I don't know his name. I only know that he exists <laughs> and that there are a bunch of Magnum photographers. And when they shoot, they immediately upload everything they've shot to this guy who's a digital master it's like sending it to the best film lab in New York or in, in Europe. And he takes these digital files and da 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 I don't know how he does it. I don't know what he does. But I've heard that this guy exists. And that he's like the ultimate file sharpener. You know, he'll yeah. just make it. <laughs> it's like a wizard. So, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, like, I like Photoshop, silver effects. I've never used Lightroom because I've been – the first time I tried to use Lightroom and it said – you must have all of your pictures in a catalog that we will control or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I don't, I'm never going to use this. If that's part of what I, I just want to use my own drives, put them where I can find them or I mean, BUR200422 and know exactly where it is. I don't want to be told where it has to be. And I'm photo mechanic, Photoshop, silver effects, or maybe a couple other, but not even much. I, I don't like to screw around with them that much unless I'm really feeling like I just downloaded a thing on my phone the other day called Car this <laughs> Cartoona, which. Oh, I think I've seen it. Pictures. Yeah. Oh, my God. It is awesome. <laughs> it's and, cool. Uh, like <laughs> giant sales, you know, they'll have 10 mm -hmm. more sales. Through and the roof. I don't even know what it is, 20 bucks a year or something. Take any picture and turn it into a mosaic cartoon or a, 
uh, you know, that's cool. I love goofing off like that. And I'm trying to be the news photographer, the journalist. I don't really like to do that at all. I want to present what I've seen. And I and that is a that's a factor of how I can get to where I have to be that my camera can see what I want it to see. That's really what it's it's about getting through closed doors. It's about getting past rope lines. It's about about getting in with a candidate when nobody else is. Right. So then two last questions. Uh, your favorite yeah. lens today and uh, short answer why? Um, probably the 100, 400 zoom, just because mm -hmm. it's so, you, you can do portraits at 100 and it's actually pretty good even though it's a bit slow. Uh, it's the one I really, in the last year and a half, I would say I wouldn't want to live without. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, I don't know, there's some short zooms that I really like. Uh, uh, 24-105 is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm basically, and I'm also like a 51-4 guy or a 51-2, which um, I don't I don't have the Sony 51-4. That's another one I've got my eye on. And that 135-18. But right now, I'm going to fit it's one lens, the 100 to 400. Awesome. Yep. And then this is one uh, that I was kind of interested to hear about because, um, I mean, obviously I've gone through your website, I've, I've seen your work and you've got just amazing stories and photos that you've been able to capture. But uh, what's the hardest assignment that you ever received? Like one assignment that you got that you were just really um, sweating to try to make something happen and, and get great images out of? Well, I got assigned in December of... 05 to go to the Gulf Coast in New Orleans and photograph Katrina, which the results oh, of Katrina along the, the, the Gulf Coast. And, um, and it was not just New Orleans. It was New Orleans plus everything from like Galveston. And plus there had been another tornado or another hurricane three weeks after Katrina. And from there, all the way through the Mississippi Delta, there had been just huge destruction. And I flew to Houston, and I took me two days to drive to New Orleans, and I got there, and I got a room, and the room had Wi-Fi, and that was like, okay, at least Wi-Fi works. Mm -hmm. I got my cameras all ready, and I'm the four or five, and I had the film holders loaded, and I had my digital cameras, and I went out and had coffee the first morning. A cafe du monde, and I had a couple of beignets and coffee. <laughs> and then I went back to my room, and I just went into my room about 10 o'clock, and I didn't move till like 7 that night. And I think I went out and had dinner. I couldn't move. I was absolutely paralyzed by trying to figure out how in the hell do I, one guy, do pictures that mean something that has touched so many people. And the next day I kind of got rolling, but there was, I mean, and I told this story mm -hmm. once on a panel with Jody Cobb and Sam Abel, two other really great, famous, well-deserved, famous geographic photographers. And they told the exact same story that they'd been on stories where they were just completely paralytic and the weight of what they were trying to do was just crushing them. And the next day I went out and I found a little something. And then the second day, so it's, I think it's a kind of a standard thing that happens to people when all of a sudden you're confronting your own limitations and your humanity about how do I make a picture that tells a story that represents so much. So that, I think for me, that was like probably the most shocking that I didn't, I can't walk, I remember kind of walking back from the cafe and I'm gonna go in there and I get up to the room and it's like, okay, what the hell do you do now? Yeah. So it, it ended up, I, think I figured it out and I made some pretty good pictures, but it took, took a few days to get going. And then it took a few weeks to really make all those pictures. Yeah, that can, that, oh, that I could uh, understand. If you're, not human, you're, if you're not human, then you're lacking something in your photography, I think. So I don't, I'm not shocked now when I have people tell me those kind of stories. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, this was something, I don't, I don't know if I could frame this in a question, but you know, a lot of photographers that I know that have covered some events like this, wars and, uh, you know, terrible disasters that have happened. Um, and I, I guess my camera just flipped off, so I'll just uh, keep going with the audio here. But um, 
hold on. Let me see. Add to the stream. There it goes. All right. So uh, let me remove. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there it goes. Did it cut out for a second? It did. All right. I think my camera died on me here. So, um, but the the question is, when all of these crazy things are happening, and you've made a career of seeing just some of the the most craziest things that could happen in life, do you do you see maybe not for yourself, but your peers uh, lose a little bit of their humanity in a way, like? Because I could just imagine if I had an assignment like that where I'm going to go see, you know, try to photograph Hurricane Katrina and 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 kind of what happened, I would just imagine, I don't know, like maybe I'm too sensitive, but I feel like that would just well, really I, hit I, me. I, I don't think that, I think you need that sensitivity. And if you're really trying to connect with people and do pictures that people will respond to, uh, at the same time, uh, is there a... Um, you know, does it some does it take something out of you? I mean, I did it for forty years, I suppose, mm -hmm. thirty five years, and um, but I think what also happens is that it feeds back into you. Uh, the energy feeds back into you. It doesn't simply take away from you. And even in tough situations, there are things that happen which kind of restore your humanity that might have been lost an hour before or. The day before, I don't know. I mean, you, you know, you could write a Susan Sontag essay about this kind <laughs> of thing for a very long time. I think, but I think I'm restored by taking pictures. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Well, listen, thank you so so much for uh, taking the time to uh, answer questions and to tell us some of these stories. I know I found them super interesting. And uh, for those of you who are watching, if you guys. Uh, found this story, all the stories that uh, David shared interesting, you know, uh, leave a thumbs up on the video, share it with a friend that you think, uh, you know, might want to hear uh, some of the awesome stories that he just shared tonight. And uh, where, what are you working on? Where, where, um, where can we uh, send everybody who's watching? Well, I'm, to, uh, I'm, I'm working on my dog's Instagram. <laughs> they call Which, me, I better get at least three or four followers out of this. They, uh, <laughs> they call me little Tyrone. Let me see. They, I want to put this up on the screen. Keep talking. Little Tyrone. I mean, a few people here, I think, even know about him. It's just, for me, it's a fun way to kind of take his uh, persona over briefly uh, every couple of days and make a picture that is not something I'll put on my own Instagram. And uh, just... It's a thing to do. I'm not really shooting much on the big story right now and uh, hope to be doing some politics later as the year. There we go. They call me Little Tyrone. What yeah, a it's, cutie. It's very witty. The writing is really very witty. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, uh, hopefully we'll get, we'll get some uh, followers here for you on your Instagram. Okay. They call me Little Tyrone. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for joining and uh, have a good night. Stay safe out, safe out there. Thank you, too. All best to you guys and everybody in D.C. Thanks for coming by. Definitely. You know <laughs> See Thanks, you, everybody. Man. Bye. All right.